Here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, um, in the early verses, and it really should, should read all down through verse 13, but we're going to, uh, we're going to pull in down to verse 6. Now these things, talking about all the things uh, with Israel and God leading Israel, all these things were our examples uh, to the intent. And so he lists five things of all the sins that, commit, that Israel committed, of all the history of the sins in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit pulls out five, especially for us to pay attention to. And so all these things were our examples to the intent that, that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Number one. Number two, neither be ye idolaters as some of them were. As written, the people sat down to drink and rose up to play. Speaking of the time with Israel and Moses and Exodus 32. Neither let us commit fornication or the practice of immorality. Or don't let us sin sexually. As some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ. Uh, stop trying his patience. Uh, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of the serpents. Uh, neither murmur ye. Stop grumbling. Some of them murmured and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now we can look at some of this and say, well, by the grace of God, I, I'm, I'm not sexually immoral, and uh, I've never bowed down to an idol. Uh, I've never come to a church meeting and said, uh, I'd like to meet with the pastor and elders and deacons, and I'd like to make a request that we get some gold together and make an idol. Because I can't see God. I want, I want a God that I can see. Nobody's done that. And yet we have practiced idolatry by placing something or someone above God. So this is very pertinent and very practical to us. See, the word of, when I'm reading the Word of God, it's going to be calling, it's not just for me to have a history lesson. It's primarily to unveil to me Jesus, unveil to me the holiness and path of God, what He's like, and to unveil to me these are things that I don't like, and these are things that I do like. Oh, that's kind of like the seven letters in the Revelation. Jesus revealed who he is, what he's like, the things that he commended, the things that he's for, and the things that he didn't like, and say, repent. And there is also in Revelation, and or else. This is the same approach that the entire whole Old Testament presents and then in one chapter in Corinthians, he says, now, this is all written for you who are in the latter days. Verse 11, all these things happen unto them for, the King James says, in samples, uh, as illustrations. The Philip says, all these things which happen to our ancestors are illustrations of the way in which God works and they are written for our admonition, our benefit, upon whom the ends of the world are come. So God is up to transforming our lives. So that should be a passion. And when we have a Bible study, when a sermon is being preached, Lord, change me. Lord, bless your word to the congregation. Uh, we need to be transformed. Uh, now, there's a world out there that's uh, going down the drain and, and political people going down the drain and causing all kinds of problems, and it, it can be quite comfortable to talk about that, them. Or it can be comfortable to sit down with a pastor or a counselor and talk about your spouse or someone in your family or your neighbor. 
How interesting it is that we're told to confess our own sins, not the sins of others. But that's, that's not, that's not, uh, that's not as easy to do. I, I don't like that. I want them to change. Well, I'm reading the Old Testament. Wow, look what they did. Look what they didn't do. Okay, it's good to understand that, but what's the reason for us reading and studying this? What are you saying to us? So in chapter 19, we want to ask the question. And in some of these chapters, because there is such a repetition almost, there, there's, there's a long period of time here, and you, we're inching closer and closer. It was really coming, maybe you could even say with warp speed, but it seems like we're just inching closer and closer to when Babylon's going to come and destroy them. And so, uh, on one level, there may not seem to be a lot in chapter 19 except some unveiling of some of this. But there are some key words in this that we need to hang our hat on. Because God has given this for our instruction, for our admonition, uh, because we're living in this present age. And so we're told to take heed, lest we stumble. All right, any thoughts or questions before we get into chapter 19? Well, that take heed that you talked about at the end there, it's not just hearing it and then moving forward, it's taking that in and actually applying it. Yes. There's, there's an action of doing. Yes, yeah. And that we have to discipline ourselves because we, we are content. Generally, we are too content with just to listen and receive some good information and without the application. And uh, just in, in this group, there'll be, there's one section of scripture that we're looking at, but there'll be a number of different applications depending on what's going on in your life or mine at this present time. All right. Chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. Go and get the potter's earthen flask or bottle and take some of the elders of the people and some of the elders of the priest and go out to the valley of the son of Hinnon, which is by the entry of the east gate, will be referred to as the potchard gate, and proclaim there the words that I will tell you. And so, in chapter 18, God has shown how that he can take the clay and mold and, and make a, a wonderful vessel. If it's marred, uh, he can start over and reshape. And uh, there's, a, there's a concept here in, the, in the being cl as clay in the master's hand. Uh, where the Lord is shaping, shaping us. And of course, clay has no feelings, but we do. And we have feelings and emotions, and, and we have responses as the, the potter's wheel and the potter, potter's hands are shaping our lives. And uh, very often, we don't understand what's going on. And so we spend a lot of time in Job. And it's interesting, again, that in the New Testament, there's just, out of all those chapters, the Holy Spirit in the New Testament just pin, pinpoints on one thing. Uh, remember what that was? The patient endurance that God was working. Uh, faith to believe, faith to trust. And we also saw that it should be encouraging to us. It's not an, not an excuse for our flesh. But, uh, you know, Job wavered. But throughout the book of Job, he, there, there are testimonies of his faith. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And so, uh, again, the, the Old Testament is very instructive for us in helping us to see life as it really is. And so here is a, here is a clay pot or a 
is going to be a potter or a vessel of some sort, and it's in the hands of the potter. Now, if the clay gets hard, uh, it's unalterable. And then it can be broken. And so we can look to the scriptures and think in terms of a concept that's given there, uh, developing a hard heart that is resistant to the working of the Lord. Guard your heart, the scripture says. So go out to the valley of the son of Hinnom. This was, uh, was a, apparently a terrible place south of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. It was used like a garbage dump, smoldering fires. And it is believed there was a place of child sacrifice, uh, a place where there was worship under Josiah, the king under which Jeremiah first began to labor and minister. Josiah was a good king, and he destroyed uh, the shrines that were there, and the valley was used as a place to burn garbage and probably to burn the bodies of criminals. So it's... It's intertwined in all of this, and in the New Testament we come to the word Gehenna, which is rooted in all of this. And so some people, because of these roots, they say, well, see there, um, hell is not eternal. Hell is just a temporal fire, and it, you, pour, you put stuff in, and it burns up, and it's gone. Uh, do you believe that the Bible teaches, that Jesus teaches, that hell is a place where there is fire? Say yes. I, I, I'm not prepared at this point to turn those passages, but I think all of you know that that's, that's reality. Now, obviously something is going on beyond that which is physical, because a physical fire will simply burn up and that's it. But the scriptures, and Jesus does the most teaching on this, is if they're playing, it's not a burning up and that's it. Uh, the whole group of Seventh day Adventists and maybe others uh, believe in annihilation. They don't believe in eternal punishment. Um, but I like the concept that, that sometimes it's missed. And I'm all for focusing on the fires. It's even stated in the book of Revelation. It's, it's obvious, it's, 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 got, it's painful because the context of the words tell us that. But the, the, the greatest thing there is not the fire. The greatest thing about hell is the absence of, 100% absence of all of God's grace, favor, love, kindness, mercy, forgiveness, and it is the presence of only of his wrath, his holy and just wrath. And Jesus suffered that for our sake on the cross. And we, we, we find his agony. As the eternal son of God, he knew what he was headed toward. And so in the Garden of Gethsemane, his prayers, if there's any other way, and it's Sweat drop is like as of blood. Uh, a wonderful reality is once we have that time of prayer, there, there is seen, there is no anxiety or hesitancy or further praying from Jesus when you go all the way through the cross. And the, the, but when you get to him saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He experienced a total breach of all love, favor, goodness, kindness, mercy, love. And he was experiencing only the holy and just wrath of his father being poured out on his son because Jesus took upon himself willingly our sin debt. And so... Uh, when Jesus spoke of hell or Gehenna, 
on the one level is speaking of this place outside the walls of Jerusalem. And uh, so it's a graphic and an effective picture, but it's not the whole picture. You have to make sure you bring in the additional concept of specifically uh, wrath, the wrath of God, and it's in the Revelation, it's called the lake of fire. So, in verse 3, the beginning, uh, he says, And say, Hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Jerusalem, kings of Judah and his inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring such a catastrophe on this place that whoever hears it, his ears will tingle. And so, this is no uh, light message. And he used the term plural for kings because this was not just a message for whoever was king at that moment, but for who uh, would be king and also responsible for apostasy. So it's going to bring a catastrophe on this place, and whoever hears it, uh, his ears will tingle. So here's a place that is associated with idolatry and child sacrifice, and, and we see God's judgment. Now again, uh, our situation in America is quite different than in Israel, but we have a problem with the same sins, don't we? We are increasingly in our time demonstrating an incredible hatred for children. Not, uh, we're not burning them in the fire, uh, but we're, we're killing them in the womb in the most incredible ways. And those who are alive, uh, we're taking them as young three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine-year-old boys and girls and forcing upon them sex changes. So we, 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 we live in a nation and that is going down similar steps to ancient Israel and ancient Judah. But what, in thinking about this this week, one of the things that, that came again to my mind is, and we're not giving a lot of information, but we're given what we need. God is always doing his work. God, is always, God always has his people, and it's important for his people to be obeying him and serving him regardless of what everybody else is doing. So, while all of this is going on, who's growing up in the middle of this? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. And they are... Without cause, without justification, they are, in, they are taken out of their land, they are prisoners, and they are going to be uh, transformed into Babylonians if the Babylonians have their way. So these concepts are not new. This is, this is the way man in rebellion does. So I need, I need to be, and you and I need to be, we need to realize that in the, no matter how dark it is out there, it is possible to be a Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and a Daniel. Whether, whether, whether it's before uh, you're transported to another land or not. I don't know if you've ever seen this, and I'm not trying to be, not trying to be overdramatic or depressing, but it's just, it is depressing when you look at what men are doing. But in World War II, uh, I mean, I was born in 45, right at the end of World War II. I didn't know anything about it, heard about it, thought about it. But one of the things that never was on my radar until I went to California to do the wedding of uh, one of our missionaries, whose name just went south, Mark, Mark and, anyway, she was a Amer Japanese-American. 
and some of her family, I was, I was told I need to be careful around them because they're still angry. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Japanese Americans were quickly carted off. All they could take was all they could take with them, put in trains and taken to camps and that have one room. Uh, that's a frightening scene. I have a railroad behind my house. <laughs> but in the midst of all that, in the midst of Siberia, in the midst of all the countries in Africa and all the uh, Islamic countries, God has a people. In the midst of America, where we have a whole different set, we still have a lot of freedoms, and we have all this stuff that pulls against us being godly men and women. We have to come to grips with, it's always been that way ever since Cain killed Abel. There's been conflict, there's been martyrdom, there's been a price to pay to be a faithful child of God in the midst of it all. So, just to remember that while all of this is going on, God still has a people, and he does today. So in verse 4 through 5, he says, Behold, because they have forsaken me and made this an alien place, because they have burned incense in it to other gods, whom neither they nor their fathers nor the kings of Judah have known, and have filled this place with the blood of the innocents, they have also built the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or speak, nor did it come to my mind. This is one of the things that highly distinguishes the true and the living God, and the God of scriptures from the religions of the world. There is, no, there is no child sacrifice. God has never promoted that for anybody. Is, aren't you forgetting about uh, Abraham and Isaac? People like to bring that up. Well, at the end of the day, God demonstrated not his being in favor of, of child sacrifice, but of him not being in favor. He prohibited it. Don't, don't forget how it ended. And it was God's doing. Uh, you can't use that one instant as a, as a statement that claiming that God favors child sacrifice, even though many, many try to do that. Okay. So it just didn't even come to my mind to do such a thing. And again, the, the statement here, the incident of Abraham's interrupted sacrifice of Isaac in Genesis 22 was an emphatic way for God to say, I do not want human sacrifice. All right, in verse 6 through 9, more description of the catastrophe to come. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that this place shall be no more called uh, Trophet or the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom, or the Son of Hinnom, but the Valley of Slaughter. I will make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem in this place, and I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies and by the hands of those who seek their lives. Their corpse will I give as meat for the birds of heaven and for the beast of the earth. I will make this city desolate and a hissing, and everyone who passes by it shall be astonished and hiss because of all its plagues. I will cause them to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters, and everyone shall eat the flesh of his friend in the siege and in the desperation with which their enemies and those who seek their lives shall drive them to despair. There's passages like this that people 
uh, their stomach starts to turn and they want to get angry with God and say, you know, God, why would you do that? Or even, why would you allow that? How are you going to answer that? It's the consequences of sin. He's a just God, he's a holy God, and when, when God releases the restraints, this is, this is what happens. In Romans 1, over, uh, God gave them over, God gave them over, God gave them over. And uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, Ephraim has gone after his idols, let him alone. One of the most frightening, see, the wrath of God is not just future, the wrath of God is right now. And when you, if when you look at what is going on in America, even the world, but I think especially America, this is where we live, uh, it seems to me that there has been a radical change in America in my lifetime. A radical change from a world. Do we have sinners? Uh, when I was growing up, I can personally testify that we did. But there was a restraint. And now there's no restraints. And so it's, it's a frightening time on the one hand. It should be an alarming time. And, and uh, God's design in allowing all this is that we wake up, repent. And not that they wake up and repent, but that we, in our life, what's in, what's in my life that's not pleasing to the Lord? This, this whole scene here was, was very horrendous. Uh, one person said, for the body to remain unburied, this is what was described here, thereby providing food for carrion birds and rodents was a thing of unspeakable horror to the ancient Jews. And yet it didn't faze them. You know, make the city desolate because of plagues. Uh, and they were... They were reduced to cannibalism uh, due to their hunger. Unspeakable. In verse 10 and 11, then you shall break the flask or the bottle in the sight of the men who go with you and say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, even so I will break this people and this city as one breaks a potter's vessel which cannot be made whole again and they shall bury them, and there shall be no place to bury them. G. Uh, Campbell Morgan said, If a man or a nation, in spite of all the patient grace of God, persist in courses of evil and rebellion, then he will break in pieces. To find in the redeeming purpose of Jehovah, a tolerance for sin is of all evils most terrible. And we're living in a time when people are more than tolerant to allow sin. Think nothing of it. And a very horrendous evil it is. To And again, uh, I was thinking if, if you're in a position, you can, you can be where you, where you work and you're facing it. Well, if I humbly but, pol but boldly take a stand, there's going to be a price to pay. Uh, I still remember before I had ever, the little church I pastored in Georgia when I was 18, that met once a month every fourth Sunday. And that was a preaching point. I don't know if that was pastoring or not. <laughs> But uh, when I got to Hartsville in January 1969, I, I, was, I started pastoring. But before that, when I was at Belmont College, uh, I was called to be interim pastor at a mission up at Smithville. On the first Sunday, we went and had Sunday dinner with the treasurer and his wife. And we're enjoying Sunday dinner, and he proceeded to tell how they got rid of their former pastor. <laughs> he said, we just stopped giving. And they squeezed him out. And I'm just a kid. Is this what I'm getting into? <laughs> right. 
and this is a long journey, and mine is mild compared to what others have had. But, but no matter where you are, what your position is in life, where you work, we live in a time when there's going to be a price to pay to be found faithful to the Lord, and he is worthy that we pay it. In verse 15, then Jeremiah came from uh, Tophet, where the Lord had sent him to prophesy, and he stood in the court of the Lord's house and said to all the people, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring on this city and on all the towns all the doom that I have pronounced against it, because they have stiffened their necks, that they might not hear my word. That, that is what gripped me more than anything in this whole chapter. And, and that's the danger, and it doesn't happen overnight. They stiffen their necks that they might not hear my words. God speaks as plain, and then we start thinking about all the reasons why we should be excused. Or I would do that, but... But look what they're doing. Look what they're doing. They're hindering me. They're stopping me. Stiffen their necks that they might not hear my words. That's the most dangerous thing that you and I face every day of our lives. To harden our hearts, to stiffen our necks against the word of God. We need to pray for one another because all of us have different battles. And the danger and the temptation is a stiffening of our neck a holding back from obeying God. And page after page in Jeremiah and other prophets is an unveiling of the price that one pays when you, you say no to God. The greatest, this quote here I thought was, was on target. The greatest sin of Judah and Jerusalem was not their particular sins themselves, but it was their rebellion and refusal to hear God and receive his word and correction. Their hand on their ear, their ear in their neck, their neck in their heart, and their heart in obstinacy. Father, we thank you for giving us this word that is uh, so painful even to look at and to meditate upon, to think about, and yet so precious and so clear of that which is most important for us, that we would be those who, by the grace of God, hear and heed the Word of God, that we would not be forgetful hearers, and let us encourage one another uh, to walk in paths of holiness and to walk in paths of obedience. And we bless you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.